All right. Well, Dan, I think you have everything under control. So I can hop on at the end to ask questions, or if you want to ask questions yourself, that's fine too. Just yep. Everyone. Okay, so uh, this talk is uh, talking about speeding up and securing container image builds using Builder. Um, and uh, really, it's going to cover some sort of advanced features that most people don't know about um, and some really cool stuff that's been added to uh, Builder over time. So quickly, hopefully, most people see a Builder conference, uh, they probably know what it is, or at least hopefully know a little bit. But just to level set, I'll talk a little bit about what uh, um, Builder is you know it's basically a tool um, we have a coloring book out and this is what the the coloring book uh, character looks like the the logo is a uh, is a boston terrier and of course it's making fun of my accent um and the way i say builder um you know to build container images uh but the, the real goal with builder was to be a tool for uh, a core utilities tool for building containers and what i mean by core utilities is sort of a base uh, you know, what I wanted is a easy way to um, build images, container images, not always have to use something like a Docker file, but just basically, you know, really, if we look at what a container image is, it's just a tab wall with some, you know, it's a tied up directory in Linux and then some JSON file that describes what's in the tab wall. And so what I want to do is just create a directory on disk, put some content in, and then run a tool that would basically create a container image out of it. And that's really what Builder does. So uh, um, to give you a little bit of syntax for Builder, um, you basically do a lot of the commands that you would normally see inside of a Docker file, but you can do them at the command line. So you can basically do Builder from uh, Fedora, and what that will do is go out to Fedora, uh, pull down you know the Fedora image off of say you know uh, off of a container registry to the host, store the content in the container storage, and create what's called a builder container. It's just basically an identifier um, and allocate some space and stuff for for um, you know. But it, basically, it's an identifier in the builder database to tell you that um, you know. Uh, you know, you've got a container. And what that container looks like is, is just an ID for, in this case, we just set it up to be a Fedora working container. So it's based off the image name. Um, if I pulled it again, I'd get, you know, dash one, dash two, dash three. It's pretty simple. And then the next step what I want to do is I want to be able to mount the container. Um, so I'm going to do a build amount of that container. And at that point, it hands me back a mount point. And, and I can go into that mount point and actually demonstrate, you know, actually look at the contents inside of that directory. Um, and, you know, that that's basically the idea of, of, of what we're doing with Builder. And now our, the goal there is to put content into that directory. Um, and, and when I've given a long, longer version of this, I always talk about Docker copy. And, and Docker copy was a, you know, it's a cool feature, it allows you to copy content from the host into a container image or copy content from a container image out, of, out, out to the, you know, to the host. And, you know, then I, I start to make fun of it. And I built a similar tool uh, for Builder called copy. And so, you know, just basically using standard copy, you can copy content from your host into a container image. Um, but you know you can extend onto that. You can actually use you know DNF. You can yum install directly into the container. Uh, so yum has the ability to change the root directory when you want to install uh, content. So you could actually use that, or you could use make install um, to install content in the directory. So the, the the real idea here is that you can do stuff with Bash, um, and and actually Builder has a concept of Scratch. So you could do Builder from scratch, mount it up, and then. All of a sudden, you have an empty directory, and you just want to put your executable into that directory. You know, say it's a statically linked executable. Package it up, and you're done. Um, it's 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 really that simple uh, to do do stuff. Now, there's other fields that we have in the Docker file that have to be set, um, and those are all done with the build a config command. So things like the entry point, environmental variables, labels, uh, you know, basically all this, all the other special fields in in um, in um, a Docker file we handle. There is a build a run command, which allows you to run a container on top of the image. Um, so similar, again, it matches up with the run command inside of the Docker file. Uh, finally, you once you are happy with the way your, your image is starting to look or your container images, you can actually commit it at that point um, to a, a you know, standard image. And that image can be an OCI image or a standard Docker image. And then you can push it out to a container registry 
And you know, once it's out of the container registry, you can use any container engine to to be able to run it. You can run it inside a Docker, inside a, a Cryo pod man. Um, you can use it inside a builder again to pull it down and you can use, you know, or a container D or any, any of the tools that support the OCI or the uh, standard Docker image format. Um, and usually when I give a presentation with a lot of people, I have them chant out at me uh, anything that's in red. So at this point, you guys are all saying, Dan, wait, what about the Docker file? And, and builder actually supports, uh, fully supports Docker file and um, allows you to build using Dockerfile or the way we like to do is we have, you know, build a bud. Um, and um, so it has full support for Dockerfile, has, you know, um, you know all, uh, everything you can do in a Dockerfile, you can run through Builder um, to be able to do. So anyways, then finally, you know, uh, I'd have people yell out me did you know, build have a scripting language perhaps build a file and i say yes i developed a brand new one called bash um but you know the bottom line is here is that you know we wanted to build uh, a low level tool that made it easier for people to embed the concept of you know building container images into additional tools um and then we based it on you know as simple as possible as bash and and other things that have happened is to build our libraries and you know not really building builder as a library, but in, in Go world, you know, a lot of people vendor it into the code. Um, and so the builder capabilities are, are taken, this code has been taken and, and embedded into OpenShift uh, for doing source to, source to images uh, inside of, uh, so anytime you're doing OpenShift 4 um, and doing container builds, they're actually using builder inside of these, you know, their, their environment. Obviously Podman builds is actually pulling in the builder code um, to be able to build, you know, some, the support for Darko files. Um, there's Ansible container support, and other people are uh, looking and, and embedding Builder all over the place to be able to build, you know, to be able to build containers in it. So another thing I want to talk about quickly is is the concept. You know, this talk is called improving speed of Builder, but also improving the security of container builds. Uh, so most people, when they build container images are either doing it manually or they're doing it inside of a CI CD system um, or even inside of something like Kubernetes. And what almost everybody's doing is they're embedding the Docker socket. So that, you know, if the only way you know to build a container image is to use Docker, um, you have to embed the Docker socket into, uh, uh, you know, to be able to do a Docker build of a Docker file. Um, and the problem with this is, you know, from a security point of view, this is a very bad idea. Um, uh, and I wrote an article back in 2015 um, uh, that where I basically told, explained to people that access to the Docker socket is the, uh, um, basically I describe it as the most insecure thing you can do on a Linux box. Um, is worse than Sue giving someone the root password of a system or um, giving them sudo without you know, password access. Because in Docker, um, I'm able to actually go and run containers and I can run privilege containers with the, you know, the operating system mounted into them. Um, and I could do all sorts of havoc on your machine. And then I can remove the container and all the logs when I'm done um, with a fairly simple Docker commands. And you know, you'll have no idea that it was Dan Walsh that you know, lost the container that came in and totally screwed up your machine. Uh, at least if I go through sue, sue or sudo, um, then you'll have a record that I became root on that machine at a certain point. Um, so that's why, you know, access to Docker Sock is very bad. And yet, you know, the, if people want to build container images inside of a CI CD system or inside of, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, something like a Kubernetes cluster, um, you know, they have to give access. So with Builder, we, we, a lot of, you know, really what we're pushing is the idea that you could build images either rootless, right? We have full support for rootless builds. Um, and we have support for uh, lockdown builds uh, inside of containers. So imagine launching a container that actually builds a container image. Um, and so you could you know, use a tool like Podman to be able to do that. Um, but a lot of people have stumbled, you know, how do you do that? You know, what do I have to do? So we, we actually went out and traded a whole bunch of builder images um, at Quay.io that allow you to um, um, basically you know, you can pull down these builder images and we keep them up to date um, with the current, um, 
you know, versions of Builder, and you can actually use them inside of your CI/CD systems to, you know, if you want to use Builder as a as a uh, an image builder. Uh, there's three versions of them. We have what's the stable version, which which based off of stable Fedora versions. Then we have the upstream version uh, that's based off of the master branch inside of our GitHub uh, repository, and then we have a testing branch. The testing branch is is you know it's basically because Fedora has both, you know, a release branch and a testing branch. You often the stable branch and the testing branch are the same. Uh, but basically, we keep these images up to date uh, with whatever the latest version of Fedora and whatever the latest version of um, Builder is available. Um, so uh, there was a couple of things that we uh, did inside to the Docker file that we used to build the Builder. Um, uh, Container, so the builder images here. Uh, so the first, I, I'm just going to take you. You can go out to the GitHub for Builder and actually take a look at these Docker files. But I want to show you and explain what's what's going on when we build these images. Um, so the first thing that goes on is obviously we're just pulling in the latest of, of Fedora, the latest version of Fedora, and then then we're um, installing uh, Fuse Overlay um, into the container um, and. Um, for size reasons, we want to exclude container SE Linux, which will pull in uh, all of SE Linux. So we install Builder and Fuse Overlay. Fuse Overlay is our method mechanism for mounting an overlay file system without being root. Um, so the Builder container can run as root or can run inside of a user namespace as non-root. Um, so that's you know the first step. The next step after we get the software installed is we're actually going to be um, we go in and edit the uh, uh, storage.conf file. The storage.conf file basically describes how the storage drivers are going to be used inside of your environment. So storage.conf, most people never edit it, um, but storage.conf has some uh, fairly cool features. And, and one we're going to be talking a lot about in the next section is the idea of additional images. Um, and uh, I'll get, you know, so basically the idea of an additional image is right now almost, you know, anybody that's used Docker or, or Podman has used one uh, image database, one image store, uh, where you, you pull down your images and usually that's stored in Biolive containers. Um, and, you know, that's where you do most of your work. What we wanted to do is basically allow you to have additional stores that, you know, basically copies of the original Biolive um, containers directories into a different location. Uh, and we, we envision that you could share these via like network storage and things like that. But these are really just read only stores um, to be shared with containers. And I'm gonna show you some of the power that this allows us to get. Um, so basically we're just setting up, um, we're, we're doing two things with the said command. We're turning on the mount program to tell it to use views overlay. And then we're enabling additional images um, into the system, and I picked out the Biolive shared directory as being the directory where it's gonna that builder will look for additional stores. So it'll look in its you know current its main store and as well as the Biolive sh uh, shared. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a couple of files. Um, since we didn't, uh, uh, we not only have to create the Biolive shared directory we just specified above, but we have to create a couple of lock files that uh, Builder will blow up. Container storage requires these lock files to exist. So that's all that those lines are doing. And finally, we're just setting a couple of flags in the environment to tell Builder to run in uh, user namespace mode, you know, without having to necessarily be root. So that's that's basically what a Docker file that we use for build build a containers, and they come with that pre-installed environment ready to go. Um, so now I want to step back and, you know, originally we wanted to talk about, you know, we're talking about building container images, uh, whether we want to build them securely or fast. So there's always a battle between security versus speed uh, when you want to you know, do almost anything on a Linux system. You know, there's, there's certain things, security features that might slow you down a bit. Um, and then, you know, we a lot of people want to turn off all the security features in order to build, build speed. So speeds, you know, speed that a process can run versus the amount of security you can wrap the processes with. Um, and when we build container images, we face the same trade-offs. Um, and we designed, the goal was to, we designed builder image, builder to the builder image to 
uh, allow people to experiment and basically make their own decisions about where they want the security versus the um, you know the speed barrier. So let's look at different ways of building container images. Um, and so I'm going to be uh, down below is actually a Docker file that we're going to be using to um, uh, uh, sort of demonstrate you know speed in building container images. And this is a fairly uh, common format that people use when they build you know they they put into Docker files. A lot of commands that might have a couple of run commands in different spots that is installing software, and then often at the end of the software line, you'll see, you know, this, this DNF clean, clean, DNF clean all. And, and the goal of these DNF clean alls is actually to get rid of any uh, uh, cache or any type of stuff, additional storage that you know on the side of your container. Um, and, and so, you know, anyways, that's, that's, so we're, we're just going to demonstrate and show, you know, how much speed this costs you. Um, so, what we're going to look at right now is the most secure way you want to run a container um, on a system, and that's totally locked down slowest. And so we're going to run a container, you know, we're running the builder inside of a, a container here. So we're using Podman to run. Uh, we have a um, device here that we're adding to the container. Um, so what we want here is builder in order to use diffuse overlay uh, file system inside of the container, it has to have a device dev fuse and that's not designed by default. Here we have the, uh, you know, actually builder image that we're gonna use. And we're gonna take a local Docker file in my home directory and mount it into the container. Um, since we're locking down with SE Linux, we're, you know, gonna relabel it to be able to be used in the container. And then the final step is actually just gonna build the container image. Um, so when we do this, when we have this type of description here, the container starts with an empty ViLive container. So there's no pre-installed image inside of the container. We don't know what the Docker file is going to have. So it actually has no, no content in ViLive uh, containers. And this means that um, if there's a from line inside of the Docker file, um, all images have to be pulled to this container. Right, so this is going to DNF uh, database is going to also have to be run for each run, and this is going to make things much slower. But this is the most secure because it's totally locked down container image, um, although it is running as root in this case, unless we use, take advantage of using namespace, um, and it's totally isolated from the host. There's no information going into the container from the host in this type of environment. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to start a demo. And what this demo is going to do is it's actually fired up and it's starting to pull down an image. And I, I'm going to go back to my presentation because it takes so long to actually do the, the effort. All right. So it's pulling down all the content inside of the uh, Docker file and, you know, um, uh, basically demonstrating it. So what we want to do here is uh, oh let's see if it's finished. Oh it's still going. Oh this is just setting up the demo. Sorry about that. The problem here is Fedora is updated since I last ran this. So anyways, let's let's move on to the next section while the demo uh, does its processing. Um, so the next the next thing we want to do is so we went for the most secure. Now we're going to go for the least secure. And what the least secure is is running pretty much the same command. But in this time, I'm going to volume mount in uh, ViLive containers into the container. So I have ViLive containers as the content is basically the container images on my host, and and I'm going to volume mount those into the containers. And what this does is it allows me to have the images pre-pulled. So say my Docker file is going to pull Fedora, um, well I'm already already running Fedora, so I don't have to pull down the Fedora image when I run. 
Um, but I have to disable SE Linux for this type of uh, environment because SE Linux would prevent access to BioLive containers from the container if a container escaped. Oh, but but what I get here is, you know, I can do this the fastest because um, it can share container images with the host. Um, so I don't have to pull them again and I can use them instantaneously inside the container. Let's, so here I am showing the slowest and it's pulling down the image to the container. I'm just doing a build a pull. I'm not actually running the full build a bud at this point. And you can see it's pulling, it's going out to container registry, pulling down an image. And that took about 19 seconds to be able to do. So now I'm going to show you what would happen with the second example where I'm volume mounting in by live containers from the host. Uh, it's another, it's a brand new container image. And when I run this mode, it takes one second. So it got, went 18 times faster, mainly because the image or the UBI8 image was already uh, pulled down to the host. So the, the last example I'm going to show you is sort of the hybrid model, model where I can get a um, really, really shared, uh, fa a fast environment, but it's still, um, it's still um, a lot more secure than that. So that, that the second example I used there um, would have allowed, you know, if the container has access to BioLive container storage, so it could write to that directory and be able to you know, cause, con uh, cause issues on that. Let me... So now that the, the, the sort of the medium one or the Goldilocks one, if you saw my talk yesterday, is to be able to take that Violet, the same Violet container storage that I just mounted, uh, but instead of mounting it in at Violet containers inside of the container, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount it in Violet Shared, which is where additional stores have come in. So what's going to happen inside the container now is the container has its storage, which is in BioLive containers, but it's going to use additional stores. So it's got, it has a read-only directory that we had set up when we set up the Docker file to look at BioLive shit. And what's happening here is basically I'm taking the host container storage, the image storage, mounting it into the container, and I'm mounting it in read-only this time. And uh, so if I run the container here, it takes one second. So basically it gives you the same performance as far as pulling the image, because again, the image is already stored instead of taking 18 seconds to pull it in, or instead of allowing me to write from the container to the host, I can take the container's host directory and mount it into the container. And that's basically what, you know, really a huge advantage in speed can be acquired by just, you know, taking the host storage and volume mounting it in into the container. So this is fast since it's you know, using the container storage from the host, but um, it does not, have, since it doesn't have to pull the images to the container store, and it still needs to push the images to registry and the container engine will uh, pull the image. But basically from a security point of view, it's very secure because it's totally locked down uh, container image. So, you know, the container image is not able to write anywhere on the host. Um, this does not use user namespace right now, although we've we've experimented with allowing it to uh, run also ad use additional stores inside of a user namespace. Um, it's mostly isolated from the host. There is some information leak um, into the container and that the container will know which images are being used on the host. Uh, but that information is usually, you know, all those container images usually are available at um, registry so that that usually you're not going to store much secret information in those directories um, but those are the trade-offs um, so these we talked you know basically we've shown that through the use of additional stores um, we're able to speed up building images because you don't have to pull the images uh, but really in my opinion we haven't taken advantage of additional stores um, as well as i would like additional stores are also available for cryo or for podman um, but we potentially you know if you're running hundreds of thousands of, of containers a lot of places you're going to be running them on many many nodes um, and we have everybody pulling these images to every node in the environment every time there's an update you have to update hundreds of nodes um, but 
you know, the funny thing is, you know, why are we pulling these huge images to every single node in the environment? Uh, why aren't we taking care, you know, exact, we've been working with HPC, high performance computing, uh, requires huge images, many gigabytes in size. You know, we're pulling those images around all over the place. Uh, why aren't we just using, you know, shared and network storage for these images? So when we designed additional stores, our goal was to to allow us to take and you know, set up huge, you know, a big farm of store, you know, stores of images uh, with all the content, and then instead of even pulling the image to the host at all, um, you just as soon as you, you know, the, it would be available as soon as I update an image at a say a container registry. If I shared all the storage via NFS, all the images via NFS, they would be instantaneously available to you know, all of the engines. So Builder, Podman, Cryo could ins get instant access to images without having to pull. Now there are potential shortcomings for using network storage for your images, uh, such as network latency and hiccups. Um, but you're already using shared storage, most likely. You're probably already using something like NFS, or Ceph, or Cluster, or iSCSI, or S3 to share your volumes, the, the data that the containers are writing. So I don't see any reason why we wouldn't share, you know, also use those the same um, sharing mechanism for sharing the content. And then we'd be able to, you know, as I said, instantly get our containers up and running without having to always pull down images. So the next part of this talk is, you know, we've looked at additional stores when, you know, when I, what, you know, why a build slow? Well, the first one is obviously when it's pulling images, images can take a long time. Um, the next one for anybody that's run DNF or YUM inside of, you know, on a VM or inside of a container, um, there's always this huge slowdown. And it's, it's you know, uh, if you've ever run, you know, these commands, um, it, it can take about a, up to a minute before any content actually starts getting pulled down to the container. So, you know, that time when you say DNF yum uh, install, you know, Apache, and it'll just sit there for, you know, what seems like forever. It's, you know, it's not like 60 seconds doing nothing. And then you'll finally see it starting to move forward and, and pull down Apache. So what is going on there? Well, when you run DNF and yum, they check to see whether their local cache is out of date. So there's a big database store on uh, on your host under Valib containers, uh, Valib DNF and Valib um, Vacash DNF that has all of this metadata about um, all the software that is available to be installed on your machine. Um, and what happens when you run these commands after a while is they go out to a centralized YUM repository and find metadata and download it. And that metadata has things like all of the RPMs, in it, but it doesn't have just that. It also has all the paths. So you can actually do a YUM install of user bin uh, foobar and YUM is smart enough or DNF is smart enough to go out and, and look at its database and say, oh, the foobar uh, executable is, is installed via the um, XYZ uh, RPM, and then it'll go out and get the XYZ RPM. But anyways, all that data is stored in a huge XML database. The file is, um, and, and you know, historically, uh, XML is, is very difficult to process. And what's happening is there's a huge amount of, uh, these files are huge, and then DNF and YUM spend a lot of time processing these these files as they download. And these, as I said, can take 30 seconds. I've seen it even take up to a minute. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, anytime you young know, update machines, you always see that. So imagine you're doing um, installs via Docker files and say in a build farm, um, this become this problem becomes hugely more, you know, difficult. You know, if you're doing it once a day inside of a VM or once a week inside of a VM, you can put, you, you don't mind that. But if you're running hundreds and thousands of, of builds inside of your containers, um, it gets worse. And uh, we try, we showed earlier the definition of the Docker file that I'm, I'm going to be running in these tests. Um, but it is, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the key factors when you're building uh, images is to keep them as small as possible. And so this, that construct of doing a DNF, you know, dash Y install HTTPD there, and then using, uh, you know, the DNF command to uh, clean all when it's done. So basically get rid of all the cache, you know, that, that's going to remove all the cache that was downloaded. So 
Uh, the fir first time you run DNF inside of this container image, it's going to spend that half, you know, half a minute to a minute downloading all that metadata. And then, you know, right after you install the one package you want to install, you're going to clean all and basically destroy all the metadata that you downloaded. And then later on inside of the command, you might install another package. And guess what? You're going to pay the price the second time for downloading all that content. Um, and you'll spend another half a minute downloading that content. Um, so and this is the way people design Docker files. So they hit this 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 issue uh, quite often, and it just causes the the time that it takes to build an image um, to be you know really really poor. Um, so um, what we decided to do is that we looked at this problem and said you know how can we how can we make this better, and and what we wanted to do is we want came up with the concept of what's called an overlay mount. Um, so uh, all of, all the container engines are heavily uh, using the overlay file system. What the overlay file system allows you to do is take a, a lower level uh, directory or file group of files and mount them into a uh, into you know onto the file system and then create an, what's called an upper directory. And and what happens is anytime you read content in this overlay, it reads content from the lower, but if you try to write any content, it writes content to the upper. And so really what overlay is doing is it's merging the upper directory and the lower directory together. And that's sort of what you're seeing in your mount point. So overlay allows us to sort of share read only content from the host, um, but allow you to write content onto the directory. So unlike a say a, a standard bind mount volume, where you mount in a directory, you either you know can write to it or you can't. You, know, you can either modify it or you can't. In an overlay version, you can you know you can modify it, but you're not modifying the original content. You're modifying a different content. Um, so the beauty of the overlay mount is that it's writable inside of the container, but we can have it read only in the host. So you can't have the containers actually modifying actual content on the host. Um, and one of the things we did with the overlay volume mounts um, is we actually decided to allow um, you to destroy content. And we destroy content when the container exits. So anytime a container exits, um, an overlay mount cleans up. And I'm gonna show you why that's important uh, uh, when we get to our demonstrations. Um, and uh, think of it like overlay volume mounts is sort of being like a temp FS. So, so when, when we're gonna use overlays, we're we're treating them like a temp FS in that you're, um, you know, any content that you run while the container is running gets written, you know, to the system. It can be used from that point on, but as soon as the container exits, just like a temp FS, the, the data disappears from the system. So uh, when we're going to use the overlay mount, uh, we're using a, you know, looks just like a standard volume mount in, in, in Podman or Docker. Um, but we have a special colon O at the end that uh, tells us to do it as an overlay mount. Um, and we're going to do, we're going to be volume mounting in var cache DNF into the container. And uh, when I, uh, what this allows me to do is take the cache from the host and mount it into the container. So I can pre basically pre-create the cache on the host. And as long as I'm using um, you know, in this case, say we're running on a uh, Fedora 32 machine, I'm able to pull down the entire cache once a day, have it in, in my host, and then share that between all the containers. Um, Violet, uh, in, in this case, via cache DNF on the host is going to be a read-only lower layer uh, for the container. And then inside of the container, there's going to be a, a, a via cache DNF, which is uh, where Right about content is going to go. It's actually going to go into a uh, container private data store uh, where this where the store is. And you know, as I said, what we we would recommend is that you keep your bar cache DNF on the host up to date. Now, if the bar cache on the host is not up to date, then you know, builder will you know go back into the slow mode of you know DNF will go into the slow mode where it'll download the cache. But um, you know, it's, in order to get the uh, the speed ups that we're looking for, um, we'll, um, uh, you know, you got to keep the, the host up to date. So here we have, this is the slow mode uh, for running containers. Um, and as you can see here, it's going out and um, it's running the first DNF command. And you can see that it's taking time 
all this stuff that's going on right now is all involved in downloading the uh, the YUM cache, uh, DNF cache. And you see, it takes forever. We haven't seen anything about pulling down Apache. Now it goes into pause mode. So it's downloaded the, the cache onto the host, but now it has to process it. So it's going through and processing all that XML data. Um, here it goes back out to the host and pulls down, figured out it needed additional data. It's pulling down that data to the host. And again, all we want to get is one package or you know a few a few packages onto the system, but we're spending all this time just downloading um, uh, data to the host. And let's see, do we finally start to process? This is where I need the Jeopardy theme song playing. I guess I should have sped up the video at this point. Let me see, does anybody have any questions while we wait for this? Okay, so Richard Jones asks, what happens if DNF is running the host and modifies by cache DNF for all container and its use in the storage? Um, that's an interesting question and it's really undefined. I would say don't do that. Um, and you know, I would recommend that you don't run um, containers, um, that you don't run your scripts while you're Builders are running. Uh, the problem is overlay, uh, the overlay kernel, the overlay mount basically says if you modify the lower level directory while the upper level directory is, while it's being used in an overlay, then it's undefined what would happen. So I can't really tell you what's going to happen other than um, there's a potential. As you see, it's um, actually, I missed it. Um, so it finally downloaded all of the packages and installed it in here. So this is all the packages. And you see that it happened fairly quick. But guess what happened now? We did the clean all and we're back doing the exact same thing again. So because I had two different run commands um, inside of my image to uh, uh, pull it. And then I did the clean all. It got rid of all the cache. And now we're back pulling the uh, container image again. Um, So the uh, someone asked here, uh, Michael Smith, if you're using ButterFS, could you take a snapshot? Um, yeah, I mean you could use. He's basically describing you could use ButterFS to protect against the situation that Richard talked about, um, and that you would take the ButterFS snapshot and mount that into your containers, and then allow systems on the host to modify um, sort of a different uh, environment. Um, so now we finally see that it's installing. So it went through twice to install the packages onto the host. And finally, we're committing the image. And just imagine going through and doing this, you know, many times a day. And that took, uh, what, nearly 200 seconds. So it took, uh, I don't know, about four minutes, you know, three, three and a half minutes to uh, uh, be able to install just those two simple packages. So now... Um, so now we're going to do uh, the command again, but this time we're going to do it with the overlay mounts. So um, here we have a, um, up here, I'm actually taking the hosts. Uh, what I've done is a pre-populated, I actually am running on Fedora 33. So you know, what you can do with DNF is you can pull down uh, content for Fedora 32 when I put created a special directory where I downloaded it, which might also be a, a mechanism to fix the problem that Richard talked about where, you know, someone could modify the, the cache while you're uh, running. Uh, but basically, I'm just volume mounting that in um, into, but notice I'm mounting it into Podman here and I'm mounting it at read only. And then in Builder, when I execute Builder inside of the container, this is where I'm using the overlay mount. So it's mounting via live, via cache DNF in my builder container into my Podman, into my, in my Podman container into my builder container to do it. So that basically I'm doing two mounts and I'm actually doing the whole thing um, right away. And I'm not sure why it's pausing right now, but this, this is one of those uh, when I demonstrated this or I mean this earlier it worked perfectly so this might be an internet hiccup or I'm not sure 
But anyways, you get the idea. And and what was, should happen here, what should be happening right now is this should be going very, very fast. And usually it can take, you know, drop it down from those three minutes down to about 18 seconds. But obviously something has gone wrong on my system. So I will go back to the presentation and you guys will have to believe. Oh. Anyway, as you see that, even, even though it didn't demonstrate very well, you can see that it didn't pull down all the cache data and, and do anything with it. Um, so it ran right away and now it's installing the packages, which seems rather quick. So it did start to work. Now we're going to do the clean all again. And again, I don't know what, what it's stalling for here, but um, it might be that my cache is slightly out of date and it's doing some processing on it. Um, but anyways, the, you know, we don't have to do that huge downloads and stuff like that. So usually we'll see a quite a bit of speed up and, and I'm going to go back to the presentation. Well, actually, I guess that's the end of the presentation, the end of presentation and demo. But if you think about this, right, because we were able to take the uh, uh, volumes in and mount them in as read only into the container, the biolab by cache, again, we're, we're doing this as securely as possible. Um, you know, there is potential information leak, but again, that's really shared content that people would expect to be able to read um, from the host into the containers, and I can totally control it. If you were doing this on RHEL, you could actually have volumes. You could you know, use and pre-populate um, RHEL 7, RHEL 8, um, Ubuntu. Well, Ubuntu apt is better than, than, than YUM in this category, but you could have multiple Fedora uh, repositories. You could have uh, OpenSUSE repositories. You could have all of those on a single host and just have, say, a cron job that would run once a day to download all these images. Um, so I guess that's the end of my presentation at this point. If we could open it up to any anybody have any additional questions. Let's see if it finally finished. Okay, so my pre whatever that pause is, is causing, it took uh, 167 seconds. So it would have taken a lot uh, quicker, but I'm not sure what's going on that's causing the, the uh, uh, failure, but that's... Uh, one of those demo things. I should pre-record it and then I could do the fake stuff. But anyways, any other questions? Okay, I guess uh, at this point we could Here comes a niche. Yeah, no, I just hop it on in case. Oh. Yeah, I think we're good to go then. So just as a reminder, folks, um, we do have a breakout room available. I'll drop a link to that in chat right now. Um, so if you want to continue the conversation, I'm sure Dan will be there for at least some time. Yeah. So I, I actually should have pointed out um, that, that all this technology now is being put into OpenShift. So um the open chip builders are, are starting to take advantage of some of these features to be able to speed up uh builds as much as possible um and um um so you know really you know that that's our goal is to if you had you know huge farms of machines to get rid of these you know everybody pulling the images repeatedly and everybody pulling down the the yum and dnf caches all the time so I will go to the networking so, room and uh... Uh, before you hop off, Dan, we just got um, a question. So Michelle is asking if you have any idea when the Ansible containers integration is happening. So the, uh, I mean that's not something our team is working on, but there is uh, there is Ansible containers work going on right now um, for Builder. I believe I believe people this is a thing called the Ansible Blender, uh, which is. Uh, um, is available um, 
um, now. So there is Ansible bindings to all this stuff available at this point. Okay, I will go to the networking room, I guess. Thanks, man. Yep. Um, Show me pictures that match. <laughs> 